Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Greens Farms Church. Thank you for joining us here on YouTube. I hope that you've subscribed to our channel by now. If not, just hit the little subscribe button below and click that little bell icon in order to customize your notifications. And if you are watching live in our virtual meeting house on Zoom, I hope you will stick around for a post-service conversation about our text and sermon for the day. Today's discussion will be led by Jeff Ryder and Alan Hilton. This morning, we continue our sermon series, Under Construction. For the last few weeks now, we have been looking at all the ways that the scriptures describe faith formation and discipleship by using metaphors like foundation and cornerstone and craftsmanship. So now, as we prepare our hearts for worship, let's enter together a time of prayer. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks with grateful hearts this day and always for your comfort and your strength, especially during these difficult days. As we continue to struggle not only with a virus that would seek to ravage our bodies, but also the diseases of hatred, violence, prejudice, and injustice that would seek to destroy our spirits. We pray this morning that you would build us and form us into the people you have called us to be, loving you with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and doing for others what we would want done for us. As we now lift our hearts and voices together, we pray with the words Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lead me, Lord, lead me in thy righteousness. Make thy way plain before my face. Friends, I am delighted to be with you on this June Sunday. I'm delighted to continue with you our great under construction sermon series at Greens Farms Church. You'll remember that as the church gets built up around us or next to us or in town, we're looking at how the church that is not a building, the church that is the gathering of God's people in Christ, is also an under construction body, an under construction building. And so the first week, we looked at how God brings us together, builds us as living stones into a temple where God lives. The second week, we, we talked together about how that happens individually, that each of us, in our own way, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are 
our presence in the world is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So we're community and we're individually reflecting the glory of God. Last week, Jeff Ryder led us in a conversation about the kind of life that stones lead. Now these metaphors are starting to get a little hard to follow, right? That, that's what, kind, what shape do stones have? And so talked about a passage from Jesus' teaching in which self-sacrifice, giving up one's own prerogatives, for the sake of others, is a telltale sign of a disciple. Uh, anyone who loses his life shall find it, says Jesus. Take up your cross and follow me, says Jesus. This week, we turn to torture the metaphor even more, because if we're all being built up as living stones, one could start to think that the builder is God, period. But it turns out that some of the stones are also builders. This week we look at leadership, how God partners with people to build the church. So in that interest, we join me in prayer, and then we'll get started. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 2020 hasn't exactly been the easiest time to lead in the United States of America or anywhere in the world. COVID has produced a sort of urgency of response and a need on the part of populations for somebody to tell them where to go or how to go there or tell them how much they can do or not do. Leadership is of the essence in 2020 and then, and then come along the interruptions that happen with George Floyd's death and others at the hands of white policemen for black uh, victims and a whole other crisis breaks out. It's not an easy year to lead. And so we would hope that leadership would come forth and especially shine this year. But as we look around, it seems like Washington has a sort of leadership crisis. I have a friend, Ann Harbison, who is a consultant with corporations and good at it. She worked with Gallup and now she has her own shingle. And in crisis, she always posts on Facebook. She always tells her clients. She always tells her friends, look for the leaders. And that has been hard these days. Leadership is of the essence, but leadership is in short supply. Now, starting with good to great way back in the 90s and early 2000s, there came a, a sort of revisiting of what the ideal leader looks like. Jim, Jim Collins wrote the book Good to Great, and there became a resurgence of looking at the character of good leaders. And in that book, Jim Collins made a, a really astonishing claim. As he looked around in the age of Iacocca, in the age of Jack Welch, everybody thought the kind of whippersnapper celebrity CEO was the thing. And Jim Collins defied that by showing that the companies that were going from good to great, whose numbers improved greatly, actually usually had leaders whose primary quality was humility that led to servant leadership. People shook their heads and rubbed their eyes when they read it because it seemed like the superstar CEO was the thing. But Jim Collins demonstrated that, for instance, the CEO of Toro, who became a friend of mine, Ken Melrose, lived to serve his managers and his teams and his employees in a way that made for great gains by Toro, unprecedented gains in their corporation. Since that time, there have been a, a spate of books. I was just looking this week at them, and they have titles like Servant Leadership in Action, How You Can Achieve Great Relationships and Results, Humble Inquiry, The Gentle Art of Asking Instead of Telling, Good to Great Comes Up Here, the Speed of Trust, The One Thing That Changes Everything by Stephen Covey. Lead with Love by Ken Blanchard. And then the title that I like most, 
leaders eat last, why some teams pull together and others don't. Corporate leaders are looking for help from people who tell them how to serve their teams, how to serve their customers. I have a friend who wrote a book called Return on Customer. And so if in the, in the Washington world and in the political world it seems like a middle school sized bash for power, corporations are, are reading between the lines of the world and saying we need to learn how to serve. Now good to great. Hmm. Companies that have had meteoric success or who have, have had real upswings. Any one studying successful enterprises in the history of the world would have to eventually land on an organization that started with 12 followers of an upstart rural teacher and ended with 2 billion people around the world in 2020. The Christian movement is still one of the great laboratories of leadership because success came and everybody wants to know how. Historians ask, how in the world did we get from 12 people in, in Galilee all the way to what is existing now? And they have all kinds of answers for it. My answer this morning, as you and I look at how God has built the temple for his, for his residence on earth through leaders, my answer to how it happened is leadership. That Jesus planted seeds and trained followers in a way that multiplied and reproduced itself so that you and I meet on Sunday mornings 2,000 years later. And so I want to look together at how Jesus did that, both in his actions by washing the feet of his disciples and doing other things that belied the upward climb toward power. And I want to look at the words by which Jesus described how this actually happens. In, John cha in, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus is with his disciples, and as they have done several times leading up to this, they seem not to get his message. They seem like the servant leadership message is just not computing. In this case, James and John, just after Jesus tells his whole group that they'll be going up to Jerusalem where he will be tortured and then crucified and then rise again, just after he has said that where they are going, on their way to Jerusalem, where they are going, he will die a terrible death. His two disciples, James and John, start to fight with the others over who gets the best seats in Jesus' coming kingdom. Can you believe that? Can you believe that just after he says, I'm going to die, and you can hear the minor tones and the, the death music, James and John are saying, I get to sit in the good place, I get to sit in the good place. Jesus answers in a way that has impacted Christian leadership and Christian growth all the way since then. In John chapter 10, he says, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. Sound a bit like Washington? But it is not so among you, says Jesus, distinguishing between what happens in the world and what happens in the church, what happens in his group of followers. It is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man, Jesus, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The leaders eat last indeed. Friends, this was world-changing news. This defied any idea of why people might seek power in order to give it away, in order to listen, in order to be humble. Fie on that would have said any leader of Jesus' time, but here he sets out to grow something that will last, and he starts by planting seeds of humility and servitude. Leaders serve followers. Right? It's revolutionary, and 20 centuries later, we still reap 
the benefits. Gilead is a novel by Marilyn Robinson that won prize after prize. It's about an obscure Christian pastor in Iowa, late in his life, who's reflecting back on the way that his ministry, 70 years of it, has gone since he was a kid and his father was a pastor. It reflects on this sort of unseen life way out in the middle of nowhere of Iowa, but the thrumming, thrumming, thrumming through is of a man who doesn't seek glory, but seeks the, the best for his people, who feels called into living rooms and hospital rooms and crisis rooms, who feels the tug of the need of his people. This tiny little congregation is served for decades by a man who will never be known outside his hometown. Christian history is full of that sort. Now you and I know that there have been abuses over time. We've heard of atrocities among popes. We've heard of atrocities among megachurch pastors. We've heard of things that defy Jesus's servant's statute. But on the whole, the history of Christianity is made of people who are buried in unmarked tombs. It's made of people who served those they were charged to serve, who, who laid down their lives for the God of the universe, who gave and gave and listened and listened. And let me let you in on a secret. You've got one of those in your own space. Jeff Ryder does not sleep until he finds ways to help your lives along. Having lived alongside him from a distance for, for years and years, I know that the fabric of his life is, is woven to your benefit, to the ways that he can raise you up, that he can grow you up, that he can see transformation happen in the lives that gather at Greens Farms Church, whether physically or virtually. Friends, the pattern is different in the church, and our world could use it right now. Washington could use it right now. Jesus set a pattern 2,000 years ago that looked humble and unsuccessful. And here we are. Centuries of John Ames's, of Jeff Ryder's, of my friend Blair Pogue, of, of all of the people who have labored quietly to serve, not for a name, not for power, labored quietly to serve so that this temple that God is building with all of these living stones grows and is well constructed. You and I are under construction and it turns out that God has human workers. Amen and amen.
Friends, we've been focused lately on two construction projects. The one happening here to renovate our campus at 71 Hillendale, and the one God is always doing to build our lives together in Christ. The good news, we're part of a team, and each of us has a role to play. How is God shaping you for the work he's called you to do? That's just one question we'll be asking online in a moment. And for those of you viewing the service at a different time, I hope you'll join us in two weeks when our Under Construction Sermon Series continues, July the 12th. We're going to take a pause next week in order to hear from our youth and adult leaders on another important project, the annual youth mission trip. Until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and always. Amen and amen.